Okay, so this is class number 16, I think. It's the second day on Buddhism. And we're going to do the same thing we did on the third day of Hinduism, which is Buddhist art, Buddhism and women, and Buddhism and the environment. So you are required to read the chapter on Buddhism and women and the chapter on Buddhism and environmental protection. Okay, so <clears throat> the first the first thing I want to do is show you the art and uh, explain what I know of these pictures of Buddha. So again, you can think about what role does art play in your life and um, how much art has inspired you to be more of a feminist or to think in terms of more diversity or to think in terms of environmental action, protection, or, or art as religious expression, spiritual expression, or some other kind of um, spiritual, right? Art is the sensual leading to something um, spiritual. It can be just the, the appreciation of somebody's incredible sensitivity to color and shape and design and style. I know that I've been in the presence of some artwork that is just awe-inspiring because of how, how visual they were in terms of color. So it doesn't have to be profoundly meaningful. It's just, um, you can think about your own experiences with music, dance, visual arts, literary arts, but they, it does have a profound effect on us, I believe. It um, educates our imaginations and our emotions, which then drive our way of life. <clears throat> you can preach at people forever, but if you don't somehow tap into their imaginations and their emotions, it won't affect their behavior at all. Um, all right, so this is Buddha. Um, again, we have sculptures, and <clears throat> just like um, there were legends about Buddha's birth, there were also legends about before he was born. There's a legend that he, he was, in one of his previous incarnations, he was a goat who uh, protected, <coughs> excuse me, protected uh, sheep against these hunters that were coming. So the goat sacrificed himself, uh, risked his life to protect the sheep. This is a sculpture of, you should recognize this, Buddha's mother who's lying down and she dreams that an elephant enters her and then she gives birth to Buddha. Here's his mother again and there's Buddha. Um, this, these are six scenes from Buddha's <coughs> life. <clears throat> and they're connected to six poses, hand poses. And each of those hand poses is uh, would be recognizable to a Buddhist as having to do with um, a role in his life or a story in his life. So there's his mother lying down again. And then this, I think, is the teaching pose. So there's a certain pose with the fingers that represents his um, calling and his place as a teacher. <clears throat> and then this one is <clears throat> the four passing sites. If you remember, he went outside and he saw the four passing sites. So this is him and he's being protected, right? He's the little prince and he's being protected from the sun. But this is when he has his experience of seeing a monk and changing his life. Um, he left his daughter and son, so that's important. Um, but spirituality is more important than traditional um, duties. <clears throat> okay, so then um, 
I'm not quite sure what some of these other ones are. Those are the ones I actually know. But you can, again, you can think about, I know my mother was an art history professor. We went to Europe a couple times and we saw a lot of cathedrals. So I know I've seen a lot of stained glass windows with stories from Jesus life or Old Testament figures, other New Testament figures. Um, all right, so this uh, <clears throat> again is the story of Buddha's birth. Here is Buddha meditating under the bow tree. And this is when Maya sends the temptation. So the first temptation are all these voluptuous women who are tempting him, right? And again, I think I wouldn't be surprised if psychologists um, would say that when you're changing your habits from being oriented toward the sense world to trying to get really focused within, uh, your body is going to fight back because it's a huge change. And so you probably will have all these kind of sensual fantasies until you can basically rip your, rip your psyche away from all that, all those neural connections. Um, there's a neural network there and you sort of break that apart and form a new neural network uh, deeper in your brain. <clears throat> Here's, here is Buddha again, and he's sitting, um, let's see, I think he was sitting on a lotus flower in some of the sculptures, because the lotus is a sacred uh, flower, and um, Hinduism refers to the lotus, <clears throat> excuse me, and then, uh, yeah, in, when I was in China, people actually ate lotus uh, flowers after the petals were pulled off the sort of the core of it it was kind of candied made into a sweet dessert so the lotus has a lot of um, sacred and um, culinary functions and purposes this is buddha meditating and here he is again in the, in the teaching pose. Um, he, this is the earth touching pose. So if you remember when Maya, after he had his uh, experience, Maya said, um, well, why don't you just die, right? You're in this ecstatic experience. Why don't you just give it all up and um, die, kill yourself? And he said, there will be some who understand. He wanted to pass his techniques to future generations so that he would minimize human suffering. And then he touched the earth and that's his earth touching pose. Um, here he is again. Um, I actually went to this temple. It's not a very good picture. I have much better pictures, but uh, I just didn't wanna bother to get them online, actually. I actually, I have a PowerPoint with the pictures. This is uh, a Buddhist temple built into the side of a mountain. Now, this is really important because it's in Northern, it was in Northern Afghanistan, and the Taliban bombed the whole thing. And they said, why do you worry about a stupid temple or a rock that's carved, and you don't worry about poor people? Um, but then I had a student um, who was from that area of Afghanistan, and her father had painted um, those Buddhist, that Buddhist sculpture. And he had painted it at a number of different eras in Afghan history, and the background sort of showed what was going on during that era. Um, and now she worries. She managed to get out of Afghanistan but her father is on the Taliban's hit list and she's very worried about what's going to happen to him or what's happening to him now. Okay, and this is a monastery. So that was the, there's two paths, the path of action going back into the world. And then there's the monks who stay in the temple and people come to them for relief, for time for reflection. That's how it was with the sisters that I go and study with. 
they just stay there and scholars sort of come in and come out and we have to go back in the, into the world and then we go there and do some study and co contemplation, reflection, and then we go back to teaching to our jobs in the world. Um, all right. So the next point was, um, yes. Okay, let me go back to the outline here. Um, where's the outline? Here it is. And what you have is, um, this is where we left off the slides on Buddhism and Buddhist art. So I can't show you two things at once. So I'll show you this. And then in class, I'll ask you what you think. So I'm going to show you the pictures of Zen Buddhist art. I'm going to read you from the wisdom of the Buddha, excerpts that, that help you interpret the pictures. They're related to the pictures. And then I want you to think about to what extent do these pictures uh, represent the view of reality of, of Buddhism. So it is important that you realize, you know, a painter doesn't just sort of get up and start painting what he feels like. It's all very, very well thought out for a long time ahead of time before artists sort of take on, decide what they're going to paint, how they're going to paint it, things like that. So you have to look at the painting and think about what about the color? What about the design? What about the way space is um, looks? Uh, what does the picture, what's the impression the picture gives you about space? What about a focal point, a subject matter, and the relation between humans and nature. <clears throat> then I'll show you the slides and you think about how does the art reflect the belief in no soul, right? So you're supposed to be so adaptive that you don't have any sort of continuous soul. You just have, you're just part of the flow. Um, then there's how do the pictures reflect the four noble truths? Life is suffering, the cause is desire, the cure is release from desire, and the treatment is the Eightfold Path, which includes right mindfulness, uh, right concentration. So how does the art reflect all of that stuff? Um, the doctrine of, oh, well, the doctrine of Nirvana, the boundaries between the finite self and the infinite um, universe are blurred or tried to be minimized. Um, the doctrine of Anika, that finite objects are transitory and less real than the infinite within. And the goal of Zen is to break the language barrier, get people in a reality that's beyond language. They can't just intellectualize about it. As soon as you intellectualize about something, you've detached yourself from it. You're in a different part of your brain and your heart and your spirit. Um, then how does it, okay. So this is the experience, right? My daily activities are not different. Only now I'm in naturally in harmony with them, taking nothing, renouncing nothing. In every circumstance, no hindrance, no conflict. Drawing water, carrying firewood. This is the supernatural power, the marvelous activity. So all of a sudden I can do all these same things, but I'm in touch with my inner self and the universe. So it's the same activity, it's just entirely different. Um, what does the image of the raft crossing the river mean to Buddha? And if you read the chapter, it talks about the image of the boatman going from one side of the river to another. So you're going from that world of living in the world of Maya to being in touch with the Atman. Oh, what place does it have in a painting? Okay, and then the lotus flower. Buddha's first sermon was called the Lotus Sermon. And uh, there was a very poor 
man at the sermon whose job was just gathering flowers that other people had dropped on the ground or in the water. And um, Buddha held out a lotus flower and just held it there. And the, the flower seller understood, right? It isn't, reality is not in the things or in what they're doing or talking about them. It just is, it's deeper than that. So you just see that, oh, the lotus is the universe as much as anything else is. Um, so these are what the pictures are of, um, you know, they're all pretty generic. So I will, I will um, go to the pictures here and I will read some of the wisdom of the Buddha. And I think I have some excerpts from the wisdom of the Buddha here. Um, anyway, yeah, there's the reading, but here are the pictures. So the readings are Buddhism and women. Um, that would be your number one. Um, Buddhism and the environment and the wisdom of the Buddha. So if you can't, oh, there's the reins is the woman one. And then the, if you can't get to the whole environment one, that's okay. That would be the third one that you do. This is easy though, wisdom of the Buddha. Okay, so let me start. <clears throat> okay, so um, think about the color, think about the design, think about the way space is presented, think about the focal point, um, think about the doctrine of uh, everything is transitory, trying to get you not to have an ego, right? To try and just go with the flow. Um, all right, so here's some quotes. All that we are is the result of what we've thought. It's founded on our thoughts. It's made up of our thoughts. If a person speaks or acts with an evil thought, pain follows him as the wheel follows the foot of the ox that draws the carriage. All that we are is the result of what we've thought. It's founded on our thought. It's made up of our thought. If a person speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness follows him like a shadow that never leaves him. For hatred does not cease by hatred. Hatred ceases by love. This is an old rule. He who lives looking for pleasures only, his senses uncontrolled, immoderate in his food, idle and weak. Mara, the tempter, will certainly overthrow him as the wind uh, throws down a weak tree. He who lives without looking for pleasures, his senses well controlled, moderate in his food, faithful and strong, him, Mara, will certainly not overthrow any more than the wind throws down uh, a rocky mountain. A man, a person, breaks through, as rain breaks through an ill-thatched house. So let me find an ill-thatched house here. There we go. There are the thatched houses. And a lot of the pictures I have here have thatched houses. What are they symbols of? Or what are you supposed to think of? As rain breaks through an ill-thatched house, passion will break through an unreflecting mind. As rain does not break through a well-thatched house, passion will not break through a well-reflecting mind. The evildoer mourns in this world and he mourns in the next. He mourns in both. The virtuous person delights in this world and he delights in the next. He delights in both. The thoughtless man, even if he can recite a large portion of the law, but is not a doer of it, has no share in the priesthood, but is like a cowherd counting the cows of others. The follower of the law, even if he can recite only a small portion of the law, but having forsaken passion and hatred and foolishness, possesses true knowledge and serenity of mind, 
caring for nothing in this world or that to come, has indeed a share in the priesthood. Okay, a thoughtless person, even if he recites the law. So again, it's the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. Okay, the wise person, by rousing himself, by his earnestness, by his restraint and control, there's the thatched, there's the uh, well-thatched house. And then down here, right down here, is a bridge over a river. There's water and there's um, a person, he says, by rousing himself by earnestness, by restraint and control, the wise person may make for himself an island which no flood can overwhelm. All right, so there, there is the wise, the island is a symbol of what you can make yourself into an island that's not disturbed. Then when the learned person drives away vanity by earnestness, the wise climbing the terraced heights of wisdom looks down upon the fools. Free from sorrow, he looks upon the sorrowing crowd as one that stands on a mountain looks down upon them that stand upon the plain. So let's see if I well, that would be up there. So you see all these mountains, so you can, I'm not quite sure if I have a picture. Um, yeah, I do have a picture of a man standing in a mountain coming up um, in a minute. Um, okay. He who takes refuge with Buddha, the law, and the church, he, she who with clear understanding sees the four holy truths, pain, the origin of pain, the destruction of pain, and the eightfold holy way, that is the safe refuge. That is the best refuge. Okay, so these pictures are, the picture itself, when you put yourself in the picture and they're huge, so the just um, presenting the picture on a wall puts you in a safe refuge. You've stepped into this safe refuge. I know whenever I've been at museums that have had these um, Zen paintings, they're like, some of them are 20 feet taller. They're really tall. And you, everybody in the room is very quiet. It's a very um, spiritual experience to go into a room where these paintings are on all four sides. Um, all right, so here's, a, again, the image of the crossing, crossing from the, the world of Maya to the world of the spirit. And Buddha was actually portrayed as uh, the boatman who helps you across the river. Um, Let's see. And then he says, uh, he advises people to keep noble friends whose life is pure, uh, to live in charity, to examine yourself by yourself, and to, to tamp down the cessation of natural instinct, inclinations. Okay. This is the other, the last one, I think. One of the last ones. If the Brahma the person who has reached nirvana has reached the other shore in both laws, in restraint and contemplation, all bonds vanish from him. He for whom there's neither the hither nor the further shore, nor the, the fearless, I call him indeed a Brahma, right? There's the, there's the river and the bridge, the crossing. I love that. Um, let's see. The, let's see. The person who wears dirty clothes, who's emaciated and covered with veins, who meditates alone in the forest, him I call a Brahma. So there we are. There we go. These are the people, the island. He makes of himself an island, or he is a... Um, he meditates alone. Um, 
let's see. He I call a Brahma who is tolerant with, with the intolerant, mild with the violent, free from greed among the greedy. Him I call a Brahma from whom angry, anger and hatred, pride and hypocrisy have dropped like a mustard seed from the point of a needle. She I call a Brahma who utters true speech, instructive and free from harshness, um, so that she does not offend anyone. She I call a Brahma who has traversed this miry road the impassable world, difficult to pass, and its vanity, who has gone through and reached the other shore, is thoughtful, steadfast, free from doubts, free from attachment, and content. So let's just go over these again, over these, and think about those quotes. So here, um, the thing I really like about this one is that there he is, the little guy, the little woman let's just assume it's a woman on the spiritual quest and she has made of herself an island and the the shape of the body of the woman is follows the shape of that rock next to her and then she's holding a stick which follows the line of the, the tree on the other side of her which i think is amazing and then obviously she's on the other side of the shore and she's crossed over. Um, so I love that one. Here's another one where very similar in the sense that the shape of the person's body and there's the stick they're holding. Okay, so the stick is following that line and the shape is really a lot like the shape of the rocks. So they fit in very well. Then there's, um, this one is actually birds because, um, I, and they got cut off in this picture. There's another one. But the idea is that you can paint a bird or you can paint an animal. Here we go. But you paint them with the Buddha nature. So it doesn't physically look like the bird or the animal, but you get this feeling, right? That it is this living creature. And that's what Buddhism wants you want to see, wants you to see with your spirit, right? With your mind, the Buddha nature. And there's my favorites, the mice. Uh, those are Buddha mice. If you looked at each sketch, each, you know, um, draw part of the drawing, you would never get that this is five mice hanging out together. But it is, it comes across that way. And so that's the idea that the universe um, appears to be all these different things, but underneath it, there is this energy. Here's the lotus plant. So again, the lotus is sacred, and it's referred to in a lot of stories. This is a Zen Buddhist garden, and you can see that the garden looks a lot like the paintings. And so which came first? I don't know, but there's the layers and layers and layers of perspective in the garden and in the paintings are supposed to correspond to the layers and layers and layers of consciousness in your psyche. These are all the layers that you, you break through in order to get to the inner Brahman. And there's the Japanese um, garden. Um, there is a really nice one in St. Louis, if you ever get there. Um, there's another picture. Here's... Um, uh, ceremonies where Buddhist ceremonies take place. And this is um, in Beijing. This is during the time of the emperor. They had, they, they have a city inside of the city. And these are women um, making cloth. Uh, let's see. So, all right. So I'll go back here for a minute. Um, you could, well, anyway, you could think about, again, how does the art reflect? So while looking at these paintings, think about the color, the design, the way space is portrayed, the focal point, the subject matter, 
and the relationship between humans and nature. And how is it that the art reflects the view of reality? Um, how does it reflect the doctrine of Anika, that every all finite things are transitory? Um, how does it reflect the goal is nirvana, the boundaries of yourself dissolve and you're just part of the universe? How does it break the language barrier? It tries to get you into a different zone than a bunch of arguments and articulations. Um, so, and there's the there's the thatched roof and the crossing and the water crossing over the river. There's the Buddha, the Buddha nature of a mountain, very different from the physical mountain, which is pretty huge and one big rock. Okay, so here again, the crossing of the water and make yourself an island and all that. So that's that. Now, the next thing is Buddhism and women. So I think it shouldn't be a surprise that on the one hand, there's nothing in the Buddhist teachings. Uh, it doesn't have a doctrine, but there's nothing in Buddha's way of life or teachings that should be sexist, right? Women are just as capable as men of getting in touch with the inner Atman, all these things. So sexism should not have any role in Buddhist religion. Well, does it? Has it ever had a role? Uh, I guess you could sort of take a wild guess. Um, why? Because of institutionalization of religion tends to get corrupted by the surrounding culture. So this one, the focus of this particular understanding, and again, there's so many different ways that you can approach a subject like this, especially when you have 12 pages. But this one, you know, it has some of the same patterns. And in this one, it's like, what is the relationship between Buddhism and social justice activism? Um, with Hinduism, there was the path of action. And um, our, so, and as Jordan pointed out, there are Buddhists who definitely get involved in social justice issues. They pour gasoline on themselves and they burn themselves to death in order to bring up, to awaken people to some social problem. They did that during the Vietnam War. Um, all right, so this is a huge problem. Prostitution is a huge problem in Bangkok. Um, I guess I will tell you a story. I was flying to Hanoi from um, uh, Indonesia, and I sat next to this guy who must have been <coughs> probably in his early 30s or something. And I just asked him, well, what brings you to this part of the world or whatever? And he said, well, I have a friend and we come out here and we just sort of uh, drink and have fun and we just party for a week or 10 days or something. And then it just occurred to me, he might be one of those um, sex trip guys, right? He might be, those 10 days might not just be alcohol that he's bought in this package deal of come and you have your prostitute and sometimes it's little boys. But anyway, that's like what you sign up for and they have the hotel reserved and whatever. Um, so it was kind of eerie to sit next to him for the next how many hours. I was just thinking, oh. <laughs> but anyway, I, I think that the sex trade is big enough that the chances of that are not as slim as um, one might expect. But anyway, so Buddhism was against a lot of injustices, uh, the caste system, all the Brahmin, all the corruption of religion. And then Buddha said, women can achieve nirvana. This is so radical. <laughs> Uh, Buddha's aunt raised him. She was the first woman ordained a monk. At first, uh, the idea is that at first, Buddha, 
Buddha resisted and a disciple changed his mind. Well, maybe, uh, you know, maybe somebody just wants to tell the story that way. I don't know. But there's another common tradition in the religious, in religions that the most independent, highly educated women were women who became nuns and lived in isolated situations. Then there was this document called the Eight Important Rules, and that's completely sexist. So that was, it was attributed to, to Buddha. It was imposed on the nuns. I doubt that Buddha said it because it's so completely inconsistent with his teachings, um, especially since he got rid of caste. Why on earth wouldn't he get rid of gender? But this is like the Code of Manu in Hinduism. That's why I, I like this book because it keeps showing you the patterns. Um, the nuns can never complain about the Jews. This is exactly like the Code of Manu. Uh, men have surveillance and control of female sexuality. Um, Buddha supposedly that said this, and I don't think he said that. But the scriptures are written down 400 years after his death. So of course, people with their own agenda wrote this down and put in the words of Buddha what they wanted to. Um, so what about in Thailand? There's this history, Thai men working away from home, women ran the families. Um, it was matriarchal system at home, but um, the, the Thai men used prostitutes because they were gone for so long. So then Max Weber, he's quoting from the, the class and social and class origins of people who impose their ideas. Now, some religions or traditions. So even in the Old Testament, there are the, the priests, the Levitic tradition, the ones that keep the laws. And then there are the prophets. Those are the ones that call out the corruption. So Amos, Micah, Hosea, there's a number of them. And then the, the Jews, the official Jewish position is that Jesus was a prophet. He wasn't the Messiah, but he was a prophet because he, his way of life was just like the prophets calling out the corruption. Um, again, you've got this problem with um, theology, religion being used to justify the privileged class. That was true of the Brahmins in, in, in Hinduism. Um, but Buddhism is centered on personal. So the problem here is that it might be too centered on personal and ignore social justice. That's, it might go to an extreme. Um, there are exceptions, definitely. But then um, this is just saying we have to be careful. We have to be vigilant. Um, Buddha criticized his very tendencies, right? He was activist, he spoke out. Um, then Christianity, it happens, and in Islam, it happens. What, what else? Big problem, religion and globalization. Um, so the financial support that the West, mostly the West gives developing nations, focuses on the cities and on providing consumer goods. Um, and agribusiness comes in and brings in their GMO products. And there's lots of stories about that. Um, the seeds are sold by corporations. Farmers can't keep their seeds. That puts them in debt to the multinational companies. Um, there's a lot of pesticide that's used. I have a Vietnam student who lived by a huge lake. And people started using pesticides and, and GMOs and all this other stuff. And um, they keep having to cut down more trees to make more space. And it's polluting the lake, it's polluting the air. It's not sustainable. You, they, you know, the old way, you at least you could depend upon the earth to give back every summer. So you've got this thing going for centuries. And then all of a sudden, the corporations sell you things and sell it to you saying you're going to have more, you can have a bigger crop, but 
over time, it's not, there's gonna be a big price to pay. Um, so the government is run by elites who control the elections. They give the jobs to their family. Um, they don't allow the laborers to organize into unions. Um, okay, they promote, they use religion as a weapon to promote prejudice against other religious minorities. Um, everything is corrupted, right? People are not ruling for the benefit of the rules. So there are programs for land reform microcredit. This is um, the NGO in Bangladesh, started in Bangladesh is I think the biggest in the world. And it's focused on microcredit, which is you give tiny little loans to a group of people who are in some group project. And so together you can make sure that they'll pay back the loan and they, um, they can work together. Now, Brock, especially, it will give like a cow to a family or it will give whatever it is that seems most appropriate at, in that particular place. Um, and then the whole point is they you give one thing, but you teach them it's something that's going to enable them to become self-reliant and to actually start generating their own money. And Brock also has... Um, banks for poor people, savings plans for poor people. They have education for the children. They have health care. They try to do a much more holistic approach. So these families really can lift themselves up out of poverty. And it's worked really well. Uh, the religion of the market. So what happens when material things become God, right? They replace that's what people are living for. Um, all right, so it has happened that girls are sold into slavery for a motorbike. Um, of course, that's not, I don't know how common it is, but it's it's not a critic, it's just showing what the effect of globalization that we're brainwashing people into thinking that's what's important. Um, I also, the big thing to me was this skin whitening product and how pervasive it is and how harmful it is. My banker, I was in my bank today and he's from India and he said, yeah, when he was growing up, everybody wanted that to have whiter skin. Like, White skin is lousy skin. <laughs> it wrinkles, it gets cancer, it gets age spots. Like non-white skin is better skin. <laughs> I go, and then you're ruining it by trying to bleach it, right? And you're maybe making it worse than even white skin, but my gosh, it's just, it's such an example of brainwashing. Um, and Western corporations make so much money, but now the local corporations, right? You can have plenty of local businesses selling skin bleaching products, but why are they selling it? Because uh, they bought out to um, Western ideals, uh, beauty standards. Um, so Buddha's response, obviously, this is not Buddhist. Um, and that's the same with Confucianism, Hinduism, the globalization and the priority of money and material things is definitely not consistent with any of the religions. Um, so can Buddhism address the problem of prostitution. Okay, it's wrong. Daughters are taught that the money they send home is a way of showing respect and love for their families. Um, they also have more money to spend on themselves. Some Westerners, I, I, there was a Fulbright scholar who was doing research on the prostitution trade and they were trying to recover girls from prostitution and get them into jobs. And a number of them didn't want to because they wanted to give this money to their families because their families were poor and the jobs that they were given didn't pay as much. There were others where, um, an example, I mean, this is just one example, Nicholas Kristol, but he tried to help a girl get out of, pop, of uh, prostitution. He didn't know that she and her mother like fought a lot and she ran away and then he she got to go back home she got set up with a new job 
but her mother and she started fighting again and she ran back to, to prostitution like she preferred it. <laughs> so you just, you just don't know. Um, but it's just to say that there's nothing wrong with this, that it's not exploitation. Um, that's, that's not true. Um, all right, some people advocate legalizing it, but, but within the cultural context, um, that's just, there's so much um, stigma and those women don't have a lot of other choices. Um, so what are their options? Factory work is not, uh, is hard and becoming nuns is, a, is an option. Um, but you have to later on be able to marry and have a family because most women do want families because that's definitely a part of their legitimacy. Um, all right, so that, that is the article on Buddhism how the difference between Buddha's message, his teaching, and then what happens when it gets institutionalized. All right, so then we have Buddhism and the environment. Now, this shouldn't be too surprising. The Buddhist attitude toward nature, um, if it's intended to eradicate suffering, it's not just human suffering. Um, nature is its own entity. You can't just socially engineer nature, which again, we are trying to do in order to save life on the planet. Um, Bill Gates is heading more in the direction of re-engineering nature, not necessarily because he thought that would have been the best solution in the first place, but partly because it's too late. He, we have to suck carbon out of the air. like. We're heading for a real disaster unless somebody figures out fast some tech and politicians will, will fund it because it's expensive or companies will, not, will be able to sell it at scale at a, at a decent price and it can compete against fossil fuels. But anyway, so the Buddhist answer, the Buddhist approach is that nature is its own force and it's changeable. Um, but this decline of the net doesn't justify the way we're destroying the natural world, but it does give um, Buddhists a way of figuring out how to, how to adapt. And then what should we do now to promote a sustainable future. What we have to do today is very different than what we have, what would have been the best thing to do five years ago. So things are changing so fast. That's where a Buddhist would want to be constantly asking that question, making sure based on what's already happened, what's the best thing to do now to get it reversed, um, to get on a better trajectory um, there are these cycles of evolution and dissolution, but that shouldn't justify not acting on um, environmental destruction. So these processes are affected by human morality. So these are the natural laws, physical, biological, psychological, moral, and causal. So human beings and nature are bound together in a reciprocal causal relationship. There's this interaction and there you can have degeneration. You can create bad karma in your relations with people, your relations with nature, or you can have a change of heart and have a moral rejuvenation, start linking people together. Um, the world stands or falls with the type of moral force at work. Greed leads to famine. Ignorance leads to an epidemic. Um, hatred leads to violence. Moral degeneration leads to a few people who pick up the pieces and have a moral regeneration. Um, the world is led by mind, right? All of your thoughts. Okay, human use of natural, how you think about what's going on around you. 
Okay, so um, how should we use natural resources? Greed is terrible, should want a simple life. These are, these are religious teachings, right? In all the world's religions. Attitude toward animal and plant life, um, do no harm. Okay, um, the attitude toward pollution is there's lots of kinds of pollution, including noise pollution. Nature is beautiful and we need to reappraise our values and we need to keep mindfulness first. Um, all right, so that's that. And I think we're done. And I'm not quite sure how much time I took. And I'm very sorry that I did not record today's, tonight's class. A lot of students had a lot of interesting things to say and we could slow down the pace because there were just four students. So I enjoyed it a lot and I sure wish I still had it, but I have it in my head. So that's the best we can do. Um, so take care and I will see you tomorrow. And I hope people are, are planning it to somehow be able to catch up because this weekend is gonna be catch up weekend because everything is due by, I think Thursday. I think I have to get the grades on Friday. So I'll wait as long as I can, but 